on today's show, continuing to look at Fangraph's Zips projections based on the power of math. And we'll be looking into the Padres' uh, team for next year, specifically when it comes to the pitching side of things. Because, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that always what's pretty crazy for the Padres? Always a question. This year's no different. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres Podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Friday, January 26th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. Follow me on Twitter at Javipeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres, or, 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 on YouTube, obviously, if you want to see me rocking my Padres jacket that I might rock for a little bit longer because it's just good vibes all around. I love this thing. 1969, baby. We're, we're, we're killing it. Um, today's episode, guys, is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase. And first things first, I want to remind everyone, go check out yesterday's episode talking about uh, batters, uh, looking at the offensive side of things when it came to the Padres position players uh, and Zips projections last year, or for this upcoming year, and comparing them a little bit to last year. Um, really interesting, fun episode to do. Uh, it's been a quiet off season. I think it's been a really bad off season by usual standards. And I'm not only saying that because of my infamous take on the Shohei Otani situation and how it's just not nearly as fun, um, him joining the Dodgers, but this because there's not a lot of free agents left and there's wasn't this was a very top heavy class. And I think that that actually segues just a little bit into the Padres pitching situation. The Padres pitching situation has a lot to do with the free agent um, market. And I think a big part of this is not only is it because there aren't many people out there that they can acquire, um, but it's also because, you know, top heavy class and all that, it's also because they are losing some pitchers in Blake Snell and Josh Hader, right? So that's kind of the first and foremost thing that we have to talk about when we talk about these projections. And that's one of the things that Fangraphs wrote about. Um, the number one thing is Joe Musgrove, you Darvish. Both of those guys are projected by Zips to be really solid, good caliber starting pitchers. That shouldn't surprise anybody, really, as far as I'm concerned. They're really good, um, at least when they're healthy. And that's one of the big issues here. As they write here, which I'm going to read now, it's hard not to see why the Padres have been interested in trading Soto, by the way, this was written a while ago, if it gets them pitching help. Unlike the vast majority of franchises in history, their collapsed cable deal likely means that there's a lot of truth to the Padres being at their limits on how much they can invest in the team. Again, I do think that gets a little bit overblown every now and then. I think they will be fine for the future. But in terms of right now, it is worth pointing out that Joe Musgrove, he's the best pitcher on the team. As of right now, assuming nothing happens with Blake Snell, assuming they don't make some giant splash for a Dylan Cease, a, a Corbin Burns, or anything like that, he's their best pitcher. But he did have that shoulder injury that ended the season last year. Um, and now while I don't think that he's necessarily expected for that to plague him for a long time, I don't, I don't think so at least, it is worth pointing out that that was one thing that happened there. And Darvish, he had some injury issues last year as well, and... He's already showing signs of decline, and he's 38 years old. So while the upside for those guys, and if you look at their 80th percentile, 20th percentile outcomes that Zips does, there's a world in which Yu Darvish and Joe Musgrove are, like, genuinely amazing, and the rest of the rotation just has to be okay, I think. Um, but the problem is, again, those are really high upside outcomes, and I just don't know if that's going to occur with the pitching staff for the Padres, at least in terms of this year. Um, again, it's hard to, to look at it, but you got to accept it, folks. The Padres pitching situation isn't great. However, however, we must continue onwards, ladies and gentlemen. It only gets cloudier from there, Fangraphs writes. To be kind, Zips projects only six Padres with an ERA plus above 100. And the two best of them, Blake Snell and Josh Hader, are no longer actually employed by the team. The rest of the rotation is a bevy of six starters. You know, six guys, like guys who, you know, come out. Uh, when someone gets injured or what have you, better suited to be plan Bs and not the guys you actually want to start the season in the rotation. Zips is quite intrigued by Robbie Snelling, but he's realistically a year or so away, with Dylan Lesko a little farther. 
I think that's true. And I think that's why the big thing of the Soto trade was getting those guys from the Yankees. Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez, Drew Thorpe, and of course, Michael King. And I think that one of the issues here is the Padres, I feel their starting rotation. I'm a believer in it, but just putting my objective cap on, it is a little bit of a house of cards situation. What I mean by that is there is a, I can very easily see things going wrong. I'm really confident in Joe Musgrove. But you, Darvish, if that guy gets hurt and is basically the same thing as last year, which is just an ineffective long-term pitcher, especially because of the contract they gave him, you could be in a lot of trouble here um, with the Padres pitching situation. Again, if he's everything's all right and good, they still project him to be a decent pitcher. An ERA plus of 102 isn't awful, not great. Um, 1.9 war, not awful, not great. Again, that's just the baseline for them. And for me, I still think he could be a two and a half win guy. I just think that Darvish is someone you can still bet on to age gracefully because that's kind of what he's been doing for a while. He has such a great pitch mix, really good hard worker. And also, if you keep in mind, with the Padres, his moments of failure have had to do with health. Now, that is baked into the age thing, don't get me wrong, but it's not like he's only been performing bad just because he's getting older. I think it's because of injury stuff here. And if you can hope for a healthy Darvish, I think that's a pretty okay number two starter on your team. Okay. I actually think Michael King... Uh, might be better than him. And that's the next thing we got to talk about. Uh, but before we get into that, let me just quickly keep summing up my thoughts. I think that Musgrove will be fine. I think he'll clearly be the best pitcher on the team. I think he could be a three-win pitcher at best. Last year, he was actually, like, really hitting his stride at points. Like, like really, really going off. I don't know if people remember. Like, he basically started off with the San Francisco series, um, which people might remember. It was in Mexico City. Uh, where he got completely lit up, he wasn't great there, and he also had that weird fluky injury with his toe. But then basically after that, he was pretty lights out, and I don't think that there's anything to suggest, unlike, say, even a Blake Snell, that things aren't just going to gonna continue that way, right? Like, I really do think that this is going to be him. Basically, after March and April, and just eight innings total pitch, he had like two starts in there, he had a 10.8 ERA, then after that, 3.6 in May, 2.25 in, Ju- in June, 1.45 in July... And that was it, unfortunately. He basically had three months of clean, awesome Joe Musgrove pitching. There wasn't anything alarming. It's not like his velocity went down by crazy. And it's not like he's a guy that relies on velocity. So again, Musgrove as your number one starter, it isn't the most ideal in the world because it's not like he's, you know, this isn't Garrett Cole. He's not a workhorse like that necessarily. But he's so consistent. So consistent. He's the type of guy that at worst, when you're really annoyed and it's a really good team coming up, he'll go six innings, three um, three earned runs. He'll give you a quality start. And I do think that that matters uh, over the course of a season. I think he's going to be fine. I think that his injury last year was fluky. And assuming the shoulder is okay and there's nothing weird happening there, I'm fully confident in Joe Musgrove being an effective pitcher. But I would feel more. I would feel ten times better if he was a number two and or we had someone who could compete for that number one spot in the rotation. As of right now, it's not necessarily going to happen. I think that Robbie Snelling, I think Dylan Lesko, I think Drew Thorpe, all those guys are super exciting prospects. But in terms of the right now, that makes me a little bit concerned. I don't think that they're on DEFCON 4 or whichever is the highest. I always forget. DEFCON 1 or 4. I think they're in the middle somewhere where they're like 2.5, where there is reason for concern, especially if Darvish isn't able to stay healthy and especially because you, for some reason, decided to extend him for another seven years, where this could get ugly. But that's what leads into the Michael King situation. And Michael King, my friends, is quite interesting indeed. But before we get into that, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to take a second to talk to you about our friends over at Game Time. Ladies and gentlemen, we love Game Time. They're fantastic. Look, you know, you know when you have like a extra hundred buckaroos, you know, in Vegas? You know, you ever wonder, like, if you just had an extra couple bucks, you run around Vegas, do something fun. You know, maybe you were there for the big game that's coming up soon, in a couple weeks. What would you do? Would you buy yourself a dinner? I don't know. You could do that. But let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you know what you really can do? With Game Time, it is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater events. So if you got those 100 buckaroos left over, well... You can go check it out. Maybe you could go to one of these comedy shows. 
You know, I actually saw a crazy video the other day of a comedy club getting shut down very oddly in the middle of it. But those things are fun. There's always something happening there. So you could go check that out. This is not just about sports, which is what I love about Game Time. Browse through the Game Time app and talk about a bunch of stuff with your friends and make them feel jealous after you attend these events. That's what you want to do here, ladies and gentlemen. It's the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the seat view. Um of whatever seat before you buy it, which is awesome because I am a visual person and I appreciate that. I need visuals. I don't just like the bird's eye view map thing. Or if you're an experienced person, obviously just a bonus feature. Um, they're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money. It's really, really great over there. You know, there's flash deals that will happen like kind of in the spur of the moment. There's always deals coming on for all my gaming heads out there. If you, you know Steam and their Steam sales, a little bit like that, just a little bit over at Game Time. So they've always got cool stuff with you. Uh, with zone deals, you pick the section and Game Time picks the seats for big time savings. There's Game Time guarantees. You'll find the best prices. Uh, if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, they'll give you 110% of the difference. Yeah, Game Time's great, guys. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Right now, all Game Time users get $100 off a big time, or I'm sorry, off a big game ticket with code VEGAS100. Terms apply. Just download the Game Time app and use code VEGAS, V E G A S, 100 for $100 off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to that big old game in a couple weeks, use code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. So they got you for everything. You want to do the big game? The big NFL game? Boom, you could do that. If you want to just have twenty dollars off your first purchase, boom, locked on. Vegas ten, Vegas one hundred, locked on. First purchase. You guys here. Download Game Time tonight, Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed over at Game Time. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a really long ad read, but we're back here on the Locked Up Padres podcast. Uh, hopefully. Uh, thriving and whatnot. And you know what else is thriving? Locked on National Sports. They've launched their first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, including sometimes yours truly, whenever we're trending at least, uh, with the local experts of Locked On plus national shows every week. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. Locked on, killing it, man. And we're still killing it here on this podcast. You know why? Because we're talking about Michael King. A king in the making, some might say. Um, I would argue that Michael King is the single biggest X factor for the Padres this next year. According to projections, last year, by the way, he had a 2.2 F4. Really good, right? That's really, really good. Um, he's the centerpiece of the Juan Soto trade as of now. We'll have to see... In my opinion, Drew Thorpe, you know, it's possible that a few years from now, um, what's it called? Um, it's possible that a few years from now that Drew Thorpe is like this absolute beast. So I get that. But I'm just saying, in the grand scheme of things, it's Michael King. And Michael King, and I've repeated this many times, um, has been really damn good for a while now. Michael King has flashed signs of stardom. Okay, I'm not going to say stardom. He's flashed signs of easily being a quality number three pitcher, and that's huge for this team. Because if you just had Musgrove and you Darvish, and then you don't really know what's going on with your number three, and you're hoping for Pedro Avila and Matt Waldron, that could put them in a dicey situation. But with Michael King, over his last couple seasons with the Yankees, 2.6 ERA, 30.6 strikeout rate, across 155 innings. Two seasons. That's since 2022. That's not just this past year. It's since 2022. This guy has his stuff, guys. Um, he could be really, really effective for this team. And Zips, for what it's worth, likes him too. If you go by different projections, 2.5 to a 1.9 F4 guy, the 1.9 isn't amazing, but it also goes to show you that, like, that's how scary the Darvish downside is right now, where, like, King's worst projection, according to Fangraphs, is, like, the current projection for you Darvish. You know what I'm saying? So that's not great. But with Michael King, they're expecting him to be a pretty good you know, strikeout pitcher, although a little bit of a decrease in strikeout rate. I think that makes sense. I think that they're saying, look, this guy has had, you know, a strikeout rate 22.5% in 2021, then 33.2 last uh, in 2022, and then 29.5. They're projecting to get around 26% of a strikeout rate. I think that's a little bit of a decrease for no reason, and I don't think that that's, that's all that fair, especially considering that this is more of a pitcher-friendly ballpark in Petco. I just don't I think that those projections are a little mean, and they're being mean to the Padres, so whatever you want. But 
I think he's going to be really effective, and I think a lot of people do as well. And I think that if King is successful, the rest of the rotation comes down to just who can fill innings in a lot of ways. And right now, Matt Waldron seems to be what we could project to be the number four starter on the team, which isn't great, but the good news about all this is that they have so many new guys that they can throw around with major league experience, like Brito, like Vasquez, like Pedro Avila, that I just think that there's wiggle room here. And I'm not convinced that they're done. I'm really not. Again, these are projections based on just what the Padres team is as of right now. Um, But I could really see a world in which he's better. I wish that they were able to keep one of Lugo or Waka. I really do. Um, But both of those guys ended up going to the Kansas City Royals, which is pretty wild that those both of those te- uh, both of those guys went. And Michael Waka signed for one year uh, over there, and then Lugo signed for two years. So they poached them, which is fine because actually, believe it or not, um, sp- uh, according to Zips at least, they didn't really love those guys for this next year in terms of ERA plus, which we were going about before. Ninety nine for Lugo, ninety seven for Waka. Now don't get me wrong, that's better than your Matt Waldron types. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be super over the top. 4.49 ERA is what they've got him at. That's definitely worse. <laughs> and if you go by ERA plus, uh, Matt Waldron is coming in at a 90. But I think that in terms of saving money, and I think that in terms of just other names out there, it feels like Waka and Lugo, they're going to be okay. But that seems like a very desperation play from the Royals, who haven't had pitching since I was in high school. Um, you know what I mean? So they just figured, all right. Those guys are definitely cheap enough. They're not in the giant price range that a lot of these big names are going for. So they said, let's give them both deals. We need to build out our team at least a little bit. That's what I think they were they were going for. Michael King, I think, is going to be better than both of them. Um, and I think that if he's better than both of them, Matt Waldron just has to be, you know, can he get lucky? Can he stumble into your Michael Waka, Seth Lugo type season? I don't really see why not, and I'm actually kind of excited about it. And I'm also excited about the fact that I haven't called him Michael Waldron yet, which is something that I literally do on every damn podcast. So shouts to me real quick. Mm. Um, But Matt Waldron, I don't know if he's going to be a guy that can get enough swings and misses, frankly. Um, I don't know if this is a situation where the Padres are going to call up Robbie Snelling or Dylan Lesko or Drew Thorpe. I think the Padres could call up one of them. And that's because of the Michael King trade. I think that they're going to look at this team and say, we're only going to potentially try out one of our guys and potentially rush one of the guys in Snelling, Thorpe, um, Lesko. That's what I think might happen here. I think that the Padres might be in a situation where they're like, you know, we can afford to try one of these guys. We don't want to ruin all of them, though. You know what I mean? But get them at the major league level and have Ruben be able to teach them some stuff. I think we could have we could be in business here. I think the Padres' rotation is not going to be the strength of the team. I think the strength of the team could be just being okay with their pitching rotation, with your occasional, you know, great starts from Michael King. Maybe if one of the prospects hit, that would be great. But the strength of the team is going to be, hopefully, offense comes back, they decide to actually hit with people on base, and you get contributions everywhere there. I do think that they could be effective there. The bigger problem that Zips projects is the bullpen. However... Zip's projections were done before all of those big moves that were made. And Wusak Go and Yuki Matsui and Enyel De Los Santos. Or actually, I'm sorry, Enyel De Los Santos was um, was taken into account here. Let me just pull this up really quickly. Um, in terms of those pitching projections, um, I already mentioned to you uh, that they don't really like a lot of the pitchers in terms of ERA+. Enyel De Los Santos and Tom Crossgrove project as the best of the bunch, but neither bring to the table what Hader did. The computer was always, and I'm quoting from Fangraphs, computer was always in on Robert Suarez, going back to the moment he was signed, but it's a bit worried now, as an elbow injury and losing a third of your strikeout rate uh, are inauspicious sights. Even if Suarez isn't a problem, the rest of the bullpen looks to be, and it's not just Zips being mean, Steamer's also only slightly gentler on the pods. However, the Padres made some additions to the bullpen. You might have heard. This offseason, it's kind of been the main big moves they've made, frankly. Dare I say the only moves they've made? We're going to talk about the bullpen in just a second, guys. But before we do that, I want to first say thank you for listening to the podcast. And second, quickly talk about our friends over at FanDuel. You know FanDuel, folks. You know FanDuel. You love FanDuel. You love FanDuel. And right now, new customers, guess what? 150 bucks if you place a $5 bet. 
guaranteed. Must must I say any more? I don't think so. I think that's it. That's all. You're probably downloading the app as we see, but I'll keep going, ladies and gentlemen, because with the NFL regular season winding down, you're probably going to want to get on those NFC championship bets, the AFC championship game bets, Ravens, Chiefs, you know, uh, Lions, 49ers. Maybe you want to bet on the good guys, the Ravens and the Lions. Maybe you want to do that just to do that. Well, this fans will think it's going to help you out. So go check that out, guys. And they have live same game parlays. They have new ways to make bets with their new explore tab kind of coming up with, with new ideas for you. They've got a parlay hub to help you make all of your parlays and to follow in some of the most popular parlays and spreads. You want to take over on Amon Ross St. Brown catches? No problem. You want to go Sam Laporte catches? No problem. They got you on that. You want to say Mahomes throws for 500 yards? Boom. You can do that, ladies and gentlemen. There's all sorts of bets available for you for the NFL slate and They'll have other sports too. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. And soon, MLB future bets are probably going to be up there soon. So we'll talk about those. But for now, guys, go check out those bets for this weekend, the AFC Championship and NFC Championship games, or whatever other sport you're interested in. They've got you covered. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. We are thriving. We are killing it. Because we got to talk about the bullpen, ladies and gentlemen. The bullpen is so difficult for me to fully evaluate, especially because the biggest additions that the Padres have made are international players. Now, that's nothing against them, but because I haven't seen them pitch in Major League Baseball against a whole bunch of different pitch, uh, players, I don't know what's going to happen. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, I do still like players in this bullpen. The first people that we have to talk about are Wusako and Yuki Matsui. One thing that's worth pointing out is it doesn't seem like, according to reports, that there's any idea who the closer is going to be between Matsui, Go, and Suarez. I think that Suarez probably gets first licks. I do. Um, I think that Suarez probably gets first licks, and I'm not saying that I condemn or you know love that decision, whatever. Zips is a little bit higher on Yuki Matsui. Um, while Wusak Go, they're a little bit down on 0.4, kind of F4 projected for him. While Matsui is maybe potentially in the one range, which I think is great, especially for his first year here, and which is why he was the bigger acquisition. Um, and they also got him for not much. So that's really good. And the other thing, Daniel De Los Santos, Zips loves him. Uh, and I love him too. I think De Los Santos, that trade, there is a world in which it hurts the Padres in the sense that if you're a fan, you might see Scott Barlow absolutely kill it in Cleveland. In fact, I actually think if, if you're a fantasy baseball guy, I would 100% like be drafting. You know what I mean? I'd be I'd be drafting Scott Barlow because one for one thing, I think he's going to be good next year and two, I think Emmanuel Class A could get dealt. So we'll have to that's what that move could mean. But they basically traded, you know, um high upside for um a low floor. Hold on. High upside for high floor in Daniel De Los Santos. Um if you look at some of his projections for this season and he's been effective before out of Cleveland by the way. 64 innings ERA of about 3.94, which I don't think tells the full story, but ERA plus of 1.102, and you saved a bunch of money, which was able to then be used for Wusak Go and Yuki Matsui. I like the trade still. I think De Los Santos is a little being a little bit underrated, um, frankly. I think that he's a really effective pitcher, and I think that while there are going to be moments where this bullpen is a little bit confusing and we don't know exactly where the, what the closer situation is, I still think that this is going to be um, better than when Fangraphs originally wrote this and did the projections. However, the Robert Suarez thing, dare I say, is the second biggest wild card for the Padres entering this next season. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, they're projecting about 0 0.6 at 4, which is really bad considering the contract they gave him. But here's the thing. I don't know what the heck happened. This is a guy who had a 31.9% strikeout rate dropped to 22.2% in 2023. That's pretty nuts, and it's not like he was getting really unlucky or anything like that. His FIP was 4.48. That's not really all that far off. He finished with a 4.2 ERA. My issue is it wasn't a large enough sample size. 27 innings, when which is like about 3 plus 17, that's 20 innings less than he had gone in 2022 is because of that injury that he suffered, and I don't know what the injury is. Now, here's the thing. The reason I'm saying all this is because if Robert Suarez is healthy, I'm not willing to say this is a sunken cost and we're doomed. 
if he's healthy, I want to see him enter spring training if he's if he's healthy, and then he struggles, then you slam the alarm, and then you say, classic Preller, bought way too high on a guy in the moment. Um, who I think threw gas. I think he was effective in the playoffs. I know that he's infamous for the Bryce Harper blow-up, but I don't think that that was his fault. I think that was Bob Melvin not not taking him out, and they should have put in Josh Hader to face the best player on the Phillies. I don't know what they were thinking there. But, and not to mention, that was Hader, that was Suarez's second inning. You know what I mean? Like, he was in there again. Like, it was like, come on, man. Like, he's a young guy. Give him a second. I felt so bad. Um, And actually, as I am recording, Fangraphs is literally down. So this is fun. Um, But thankfully, I haven't reloaded any pages. So I could still look at what they were projecting before. But De Los Santos, um, Tom Koshgrove is really great. I love him. The last one I want to talk about really quickly is Stephen Wilson, who is a really hard pitcher for me to evaluate. Because in the first half last year, he had a 2.43 ERA. Used a sweeper a lot more this past year um, than the previous year, I'm sorry, in 2022. And it worked, clearly, for the first half. But, as I've discussed many times, the Padres' bullpen... Look, the Padres as a whole last year, it seems like it boiled down to being awful in high-leverage situations. Like, really bad. Bogarts, Machado, you know, uh, occasionally Soto, but not really. Uh, um, um, Jake Cronenworth, Trent Grisham was heinous. The only ones who really stepped it up in high leverage were Hassan Kim and Fernando Tatis Jr. So that was a big issue. Even even St. Gary was bad in, in high leverage situations. I think the starting pitching could be okay, especially with Michael King and especially with a lot of backup soldiers, as I'll call them, that you could call up and Snelling, Lesko, um, um, who's the last one, uh, and, and Thorpe, right? But the bullpen, I do not think last year was just a case of being uncharacteristically bad in high leverage situations. I think they actually had gotten lucky at points. And I think that the first half ERA for Steven Wilson is a little bit of a reflection of that. Because then he had a 7.31 in the second half. Now, I looked at some numbers, and it looks like one of the things that happened is that as the season went on, now he doesn't throw it a lot. It's only 3.2% of the time. But Steven Wilson wasn't getting any swings and misses on his changeup, which isn't great. And he did completely switch around his fastball and sweeper usage. Last year, 52 point, I'm sorry, the previous year, 2022, 52.2% of his pitches were fastballs. Year after was only 36.4%. And then his sweeper, he threw even more than his fastball ever did. And that seems to have paid dividends. And so if you want to go by run value, he had a plus 10 with his sweeper, and then he had a 1 with his fastball, which was actually better than the previous year where he had a seven with his sweeper and a negative two with his fastball. So he started throwing a sweeper more and the sweeper was great, but again, he just really struggled. And if you look at his baseball savant overall, expected batting average, expected ERA, his hard hit percentage isn't bad. The big problem with him is he does give up a decent amount of barrels and he doesn't always get whiffs, but it's the ground ball percentage. I wish that watching Steven Wilson wasn't only hoping that he gets a strikeout with a sweeper. He's just not generating ground balls. He seems to be a little bit all or nothing. Um, But I think he can be a guy who's still effective um, for this team. 29 years old. It's not like he's he's not super young. But I still think that he can be that low-key, under-the-radar guy for this team that can be effective. And if you couple that with Matsui, Go, Enio De Los Santos, and hopefully you're, you're taking a flyer on him. And Robert Suarez, I think the bullpen can be okay. But I am still worried because, again, you're losing Josh Hader. You're losing Nick Martinez, who was occasionally used in a bullpen role last year. You're losing Josh Hader alone. Losing him is, like, obviously bad. Um, Who just signed with the Astros, by the way, which I'm sure will help his uh, villain reputation. (laughs) Uh, Certainly. But that's the big issue here, is that what can Robert Suarez give you? Because if Robert Suarez gives you something, if he's as good as, I don't know, if he's as good as, I'm trying to get get come up with a good comp, Angel De Los Santos was last year. If he's just okay, because if you looked at all the the relievers before, prior to the the Yankees trade, and prior to the um, Matsui and Go signings, projected for 0.7 wins above replacement. That's bad. You know what I mean? For your entire bullpen, really. But again... We don't know fully what's going to happen. They don't have Ray Kerr anymore. There's a lot of pitchers that were projected on this thing that they don't have anymore. The Matsui Go signings 
coupled with De Los Santos, coupled with the, the wild card factor of Robert Suarez, coupled with all the reasons I said for Steven Wilson, I still think they can be good. I'm a little bit worried about Wilson's control, but I think that that can be worked out. And I still think he's clearly putting together his pitch mix. Like, maybe he's going to start throwing his cutter more. I don't think he should, but maybe he will. Maybe he starts, starts throwing his changeup more. I don't think he should, but maybe he does. Again, he tries to use his changeup as put as his put-away pitch, and it just stopped working um, in the second half especially. Like I mentioned, the, the whiff rate on that thing dropped dramatically. He just wasn't getting any whiffs on it. But he uses it as his put-away pitch. So... If he can figure out his change up a little bit more or just really rely more on that sweeper as his put away pitch, which he didn't, like it's really weird that that's his most effective pitch, yet his put away percentage on it last year was just 21% compared to 33.3 on the change up. We'll see. Again, we will see. Maybe he starts using the fastball more. I don't know. But I just, I haven't given up on this guy. I think he can get whiffs on those sliders and those sweepers, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's confusing, you know, semantics, but I think he can be effective. De Los Santos, I think, is just a nice a thing where you're just getting a solid reliever who I think, hey, Niebla, hey, he was a Cleveland guy. So he knows he knows them Cleveland guys. So work with him. I think he can be effective. I think Wusat Go is a high upside dude who can at least be better than your Jay Grooms of the world. But all in all, I think that's the thing with the Padres is they just have a lot of solid stuff. And it's getting drowned out by some of the divisional moves with teams like the Giants, certainly with the Dodgers. I think that's why a lot of people are freaking out. But for me, all in all, my thing is just don't be as atrocious in one-run games. Bullpen, hopefully it's utilized a little bit better than I think that Bob Melvin util utilized it um, last year. Hopefully Mike Schultz can do some work. And lastly, I don't think they're done yet. I really don't. Um, I think they might be done on the bullpen side of things. Santos... Go Matsui. Starting pitching. I still think that there could be some guys out there that are intriguing. You know, the, the big ones that are still out there, we obviously still have Snell. I'm not totally sure what's going on there, by the way. I feel like we haven't heard anything about Snell in, like, months. And then look what happened. Like, Josh Hader we heard nothing about, and then he signed with Houston, right? Jordan Montgomery, Clayton Kershaw, Brandon Woodruff. Woodruff I've talked about as being, like, a sneaky... If they, for some reason, were screwed and they were like, we don't really think we're going to be good this year, signing him and then having him for next year could be really enticing, especially with more time given to the prospects to potentially break out. But I look at this, I look at some of the remaining guys. Michael Lorenzen, take a flyer on him. I bet you he doesn't cost all that much. I don't think there are teams out there that really need to sign a pitcher right now. Michael Lorenzen could be okay, and I think he's better than Pedro Avila. Is he better than Matt Waldron? I think so. But we'll see. Again, I would just like a little bit of a reinforcement. Can you get any of these guys for cheap? Can you get a Michael Lorenzen for cheap? Can you get Carlos Carrasco for cheap? I know he's a giant red flag when it comes to health. Could you get Alex Wood, who I've been believing for, for cheap? I think that that's a big thing here. Because then if you do get one of those guys, you have four at least pitchers who have proven that they can pitch at the major league level. Musgrove. Darvish, King, and then let's say, um, let's say for example, let's say Alex Wood. Then the fifth spot is where things get interesting, and it gives even more flexibility and more time for your prospects to come up. That's what I think the Padres should do, and I think that they will. I do. I think that there's some guys out there who can at least fill in time. Hey, if you want to just go by youth and say, hey, maybe we, we gave up on this guy too quickly, you could take a flyer on Eric Lauer. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's 29 years old and at times has flashed strikeout potential. So maybe you could do him. Matthew Boyd was good once upon a time. So I'd look into that. I'd look into that. And if they do sign someone, I don't think it's going to be one of those blockbuster guys. And I certainly don't think they're going to make a trade for guys like Bieber, Burns, or Cease. Because if the teams that are more willing to shell out for those guys haven't been able to get a deal done, that tells me that the asking price is probably astronomical and this team should not be doing moves like that. They should not be going out and trading their farm again because that's how we keep getting in the same situation. You already have your stars. Live with it, right? Live with it. See what the young guys are capable of and hope for the best with your X factors like King and Suarez. Otherwise, I think the Zips projections for the pitching, I don't really disagree with any of them, which is could be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know, right? Like, I don't really disagree, though, with them. Um, I think that the only one that might be a question is Darvish because I just wonder, 
Yeah, but all the reason he performs bad seems to be his health, so maybe he's being projected a little bit low. But bottom line, guys, Zips does not love the Padres pitching situation. And that makes sense. They just lost a Cy Young guy, and they lost the best closer in baseball. Obviously. They're not going to love it. But anyone listen to Bill Simmons, you know, Ewing theory type of potential with this team is strong. Whether or not they'll actually do it is another story, right? On the offensive side of things or the pitching side of things. I don't know, but the Ewing theory is strong with this team because if they go out and win more games this year, I need everyone to use this and remember that you should have stars, but you should also remember that once you have your big core of stars, you don't then destroy your depth for more stars because then you get the BS that happened last year where the team just completely falls apart and is almost seemingly trying its best to make Padres fans annoyed. That's really what it felt like. It's like they were trying. To just stick the knife in and twist it. They were still in the playoff race until like the last two weeks of the season. Like that's how much the the universe was like, you guys really just want to disappoint your fans this bad? You want to be this much of a disaster? Well, okay. That's what it felt like. And I'm a little bit nervous, but I still think that there's potential here. And I think that there's more moves to come um, when it comes to starting pitching with one of those flyers and also the DH spot. I'm curious what happens there. And of course, as I mentioned before, if they trade Hassan Kim, I think things could get a lot more interesting on that front, too. But that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. That about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. In terms of the future of the show, may or may not be doing an episode on why they need to trade Hassan Kim, because everyone keeps yelling at me when I do this, and I like being yelled at, because I'm a masochist, ladies and gentlemen, and I hate myself. Uh, no, not really. Might do that episode. Might have another guest on. We'll see. I'm going to be doing uh, looking deeper into the free agent class, maybe talking about some of those aforementioned flyers that I mentioned who might make sense for the team, looking at old takes, doing my own old takes exposed sort of thing. Um, probably going to try that out. Talk about a little bit more some X factors for the Padres heading into uh, next year. But until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.